Well, we are exploring in God's Word today, and uh, we're doing it in a way that is uh, it's semi-traditional in the Christian church. That is to take the four Sundays prior to, to Christmas and call those the four Sundays of Advent. It's, it's, not, it's not a, you don't have to do it, but we decided to do it this year. But it's a, it's a really cool sort of discipline, because what it does is it forces you to look at Christmas not just four weeks in a row, but to step back and take the biggest picture of it and then work your way into it on the fourth week. So that's what we're doing, and we're looking at big picture. So it's all about big picture because I get get a little frustrated uh, about this because this time of year, what you normally get of Christmas like we did last week is a picture like this. And it's frustrating to me (laughs) because that's an okay picture, but it seems to lack grandeur. (laughs) And so that's why we're doing the big picture. Because what happened at the coming of the birth of Christ is an astonishing, cosmic-busting event of all history and all time. So when you look at it like this, it's like, eh, I don't think so. So big picture. So we're going to continue the big picture. We're on the third Sunday of Advent this week. And to to intro us into this big picture, uh, again, we're starting from outer space. Uh, In fact, this is a new picture from last week. It's a different space picture because they posted this. Uh, it's a Hubble Space Telescope picture. And this thing in the center is a spiral galaxy. And uh, all the things around the edges that look like slits or disks are other galaxies. Ah. And the things that have the little crosshairs, it's from the aperture. There's three of them right there. Those are stars. This galaxy in the middle here is called the loneliest galaxy. <sighs> Sounds like a you know, Sunday cartoon. The loneliest galaxy. Because uh, those three stars you see that have the crosses on them right there, They're actually very close to us. They're, well, relatively speaking, they're really close to us. They're in the Milky Way galaxy, so they're they're near neighbors to us. Then there's that spiral galaxy in the middle there, the loneliest galaxy. And then everything in the background is something that is immensely far away from that galaxy. So that galaxy in the center there is is isolated. It's, It's all by itself, and that's why they call it the loneliest galaxy, because between us and that galaxy is a huge gap of nothingness, And between that galaxy and everything behind it is a huge nothingness. It's one of the, in fact, if you type on the internet, type up loneliest galaxy, believe it or not, you'll see this guy right here. (laughs) And so in a sense, uh, I mean, why are we even talking about galaxies and stuff like that? Well, if you weren't with us last week, this is why. Because G.K. Chesterton had this great quote. He said, now this is relative to Christmas, you've got to think about it. The God who had been only a circumference, that is, like on the outside of everything, since he's the creator, he's bigger than the whole universe. He's like the circumference of the universe. The God who had been only a circumference was seen as a center, and a center is infinitely small. So Chesterton, in that one quote, kind of capsulized for us the fact that Christmas is about this gigantic, huge God who is bigger than the entire universe that puts him at the circumference speaking that's what we're talking about and then at christmas this god at the circumference who's bigger than all the universe shrinks himself down into a point and it's infinitely small and that's that just scratches at the surface of the grandeur of what christmas is about the god who's bigger than the universe becomes a baby so that's what we're talking about and that's why we're looking at this infinitely small so in the last couple of weeks i'll just do a quick review the first week we looked at isaiah 9 1 through 7 which has this great thing in the middle You know, his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Those are big titles for a little baby. And uh, and by the way, back when we looked at this two weeks ago, I I had stated that, uh, uh, well, the LDS Church right now, for those of you who are ex-Mormon or transitioning, we have a lot that are watching. uh, The LDS Church put out their yearly Christmas video, uh, which is preceded by the 12 days of social, I forget what they call it. Anyway, I said that on that video, they quoted this passage, uh, Isaiah 9, 6, but they left, they left this out. They left the Everlasting Father out. Uh, and then someone came to me and said, huh, well, that's interesting. Maybe you're not being totally fair. Maybe the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible left it out, and that's why they quoted it that way. I thought, you know, you're right. If Joseph Smith translated it that way, although I have issues with Joseph Smith doing that, it's okay, I guess, if the church follows Joseph Smith translation. So this week, I, I pulled down my Joseph Smith translation off the shelf. I went to Isaiah 9. Sure enough, he changed Isaiah 9, verses 1, and 3, and 7. He didn't touch verse 6. 
So the Joseph Smith translation has that in it. So anyway, just to include that, because you have to be on your toes, have to be on your toes this time of year, because people will, will give a slightly twisted view of what Christmas is all about, but that right there is what we talked about. So that's, that's our ex-Mormon moment for the morning. Last week we looked at Hebrews 1.4, gigantically huge statements, uh, and I just pulled out verse 3 here. He's the radiance or the outshining of the glory of God. So this coming of Jesus, this, this little baby who becomes this man and is this Messiah, is actually like a, it's like a, a spotlight, beam of light reflecting who God is, shown into our existence. And that's exactly what that ne- word means. Uh, it's like, it's the light that comes from the glory of who God is. And so then this week, we're going to do something novel on this third Sunday of Advent. We're going to go to a gospel. Yes, a gospel. Yay! Finally, we're getting closer to the Christmas story. The question is, which gospel do you get the biggest picture from? I want a big picture. So uh, let's take a look at the gospels really quick. Here's a timeline of the life of Jesus, and the gospels were meant to contain the ministry of Jesus. So there's a timeline. Here's his birth. There's his death. And I'm going to add a few more dots on the timeline of Jesus' life. He's risen from the dead when he was raised, and also when he started his public ministry, which, by the way, is always characterized in the Gospels as when John the Baptist tells he's coming and Jesus gets baptized and all that kind of stuff. So the timeline of Jesus, how do the four Gospels cover the life of Jesus? Let's pick one that's got the biggest picture. Okay, so as you look at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, let, let's extend them out until we figure out how much time they cover. Well, let's start on the back side. Uh, let's see how far they go in terms of the death and resurrection. Matthew does extend indeed to the death and the resurrection and things happening after the resurrection, so post-resurrection appearances. Mark only goes to the resurrection. He doesn't really show any post-resurrection appearances. Luke, like Matthew, goes all the way out, shows post-resurrection stuff. And in fact, many of the post-resurrection appearances that show up in Matthew and, and Luke are unique to those Gospels. You know, they're, they're extra information. And then John as well extends back to uh, uh, events that happen after the resurrection. Like, for instance, you remember when Jesus is at the Sea of Galilee after he's raised, and they're, they're around a fire, and they're eating fish in the morning, all that kind of stuff. And that's when, that's when Jesus turns to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Well, that, that's post-resurrection. That's in that section there. How about on the early side? Because we're talking about the birth of Jesus. Well, if you look at Matthew, Matthew goes all the way back to the birth and a little bit before the birth and, uh, and covers events that are leading up to the birth. Mark, oh, I was going to say, Matthew also covers the ancestry of Jesus. So although he starts the narrative at uh, just before the birth, he talks about the whole ancestry of where Jesus and his parents came from, which is kind of cool. Mark only goes to his public ministry. So when you open up the book of Mark, it starts with his public ministry, And his public ministry is connected to John the Baptist. So that's what you see there. Um, Luke, how about Luke? Well, Luke goes back. He goes back to pre-birth. You know, the parents of John the Baptist, the appearance to to Mary, all those kind of things. Uh, That's not a bad candidate. But let's look at John. John goes way back all the way to the beginning of the universe. Oh, so the ministry of Jesus from John's perspective starts at the beginning of the universe. Which makes sense, actually. So, uh, but to, to be fair, to be fair, John's gospel doesn't cover anything about the birth of Jesus. <laughs> it starts. It starts at the beginning of the universe, which makes sense, and then it picks up the story when Jesus' public ministry starts with John the Baptist. So that's what, so. If we're going to make, we're going to take a vote right now. So you're going to vote which of these gospels is going to give us the biggest picture about who Jesus is from the stand back cosmic perspective. All those in, sh- in favor of Matthew. Mark, Luke, John. Okay, we'll do John. Okay, <clears throat> so that's what we're going to do. John 1, we're going to start right at the beginning because this is where you get the cosmic beginnings of the universe about this one coming into our existence from the very edges of all creation. So let's pick it up. In the beginning was the word. This is John 1, 1. Uh, in the beginning was the Word. Well, just like he's starting out, just like Genesis 1. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But for a Jewish reader, and for those of us who know Genesis 1 1, this has created an instant question. If in the beginning God created, and now John says, in the beginning the Word, the question is, is the Word God? And if it's not, well, just hold on to that tension for a second. So that's how John's going to start us out. I thought this was about the life of Jesus. Yes but he's deliberately getting us to start connecting this word to who God is. So in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, 
and the word was God. Now, these, this verse right here <laughs> has caused a lot of problems for people who have an alternate view of the theology of God, and this doesn't fit. So what they have to do is they have to go down and they have to battle over the meaning of the words in this right here. Like, for instance, uh, uh, the word was with God. Well, that, the word that's there, it's a Greek word that means with, but there's, there's uh, three to four really good Greek words that mean with. Some of them we still use today. Meta, uh, para, our prefixes we used to mean alongside of and with. Uh, but there's one that means if you go and visit somebody and you say, listen, this last weekend I went and visited someone, I drove to their house and I was with them. The word that you use when you're with another person is pros and that's the one that's right here. So it's not a cosmic thing, it's actually a personal thing. This word, whoever this word is, because we're in, we're in this state of mystery because we don't know because we don't know the rest of the Gospel of John, was not just kind of associated with God. He was... He was visiting with God. He is, he's right next, he, he's like a person visits a person. So it's a really interesting kind of thing. And the word was God, literally, literally, I had to look this up to make sure, in the Greek it says, it says, and what God is, the word is. It's what it says. It's almost word for word. What, the, what God is, the word is. So there's a very tight identification right here. And again, I've seen some of the craziest rationalizations of trying to misdefine some of these words so you can get out of this. Because, come on, this can't mean what it says because how can something that is something be with something? How can it happen simultaneously? How can you be visiting someone but also be the someone? Well, now you're touching on the issues of the three persons in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And John's introducing it right here. This same one who was at the beginning was not only with God, he was God. Well, then why did you say he was with God? Well, because, well, okay, we'll get to that. But that's, uh, he's really getting to it. So in the beginning was the word. Now the question is, is why would he characterize this entity in the beginning as the word? Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. So he was in the beginning with God, in the very beginning. And by the way, I might just look, clue you in. During John's time, uh, you know, Greek philosophy and thought was very, 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 very um, pervasive across this part of the world, in fact. And the Greeks, especially Aristotle, they were very much, one of their pet topics was, what's the, what's the original raw material of the universe, part A and part B is, and how did that raw material get put into what we ex experience today? That was a big that was a big Aristotle kind of question. So this is actually catering as well to the culture of the time, the intellectual culture of the time was saying, what's the raw material in the universe and how did that raw material turn into what we see today? So it's answering a good intellectual question as well. So I ask this again, why word? In the beginning was the word. Why not just say in the beginning was a creator or in the beginning there was a helper or in the beginning there was question? Why say word? For us, see, in the, in the 20th century, word is a very uh, simple word. It just, I mean, I, I'm going to say a sentence to you and it's going to be full of words. So big deal, I don't get it. So a word communicates uh, an idea and a message. So that's okay. That's universal. That extends back to the first century too. But it, it goes beyond that. And even in our culture, word goes beyond that. Okay, if I, if I come to you and I say, <clears throat> next week... I promise I'm going to come to your door and I'm going to deliver a fruitcake for your enjoyment. Talking about the thing you eat, not me. I'm going to deliver a fruitcake for your enjoyment and I give you my word. What does that mean? It's a promise. It's a commitment. It's a, it's a statement of saying, I can say it, but what I say is also going to become a reality. They're tied together. In ancient times, the only people who could make those kinds of statements were kings, really. Because a king had infinite resources at his command. So a king could say, this shall be, and it will happen because everyone under him will make it happen. Um, the, Roman, the Roman centurion who talked to Jesus, remember who Jesus looked at him and said, man, what faith this guy has. He had great faith because he said to Jesus, will you do this for me? And, and Jesus says, I'll come to your house. And the centurion says, no, I don't have to come to your house. Because like me, you know, I give commands and things happen. I speak words and they happen. And Jesus, you speak words when it comes to the sickness of my servant and it'll happen. So really those in power, in great power, are the only ones who have the resources in a large sense to say something profound and make it happen because they have that happening. So that's exactly what's being strongly implied here. 
Strong implied. In the beginning, the universe was made. But you know what the raw material of the universe is? Going back to the Greek idea, the raw material? God's word. Yeah, and it, it, it's, it's his word. Now, he didn't just organize the universe out of other stuff that was floating around. He spoke, it appeared. So it looks as though, to the casual observer, and this would be right, that the raw material of the universe is God's word. He can speak and things happen. He can promise and they will happen. Why? Because he is the ultimate authority. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the one with infinite resources. So when God speaks, it happens. There's the word. So this is why he's using the word. Because something this word personified was with God and is God. And this word makes things happen. Now just as an aside, because we could go for hours on this. Satan, Lucifer. Satan, Satan is the father of lies and so satan's business is using words too yeah. the difference between him and god although satan says he wants to be like the most high god he can't because he can't speak things and have them come into existence but he can speak things and make you think they came into existence and that's a lie and he's darkness, and he's darkness. so so it's interesting because he tries to be like god in terms of speaking and having things come into existence but he found out that since he can't do that, all he's got to do with us is make us think through the lie that he brought into existence. Ah, very interesting. But with God, that's not the case. When God speaks, it happens. The old E.F. Hutton commercial that if you're older than 40, you don't you remember, but if you're not, it's, it's when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Well, the universe listens when God speaks because the universe is actually made of the raw material of his words. That's what it is. We could go for so long on this. It's one of my pet topics. Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, th this, is a, this is an interesting uh, addition to that first opening couple of verses because a lot of people will claim that Jesus was a created being from the Father. Somehow he was created in some sense. But it says right here that through the word, oh, I blew it. I mean, spoiler alert, the word is Jesus. Through the word... Everything was made through him. And nothing that exists was made if it wasn't through him. So could Jesus, a created being, be the result of himself? N no. So th this is the logic that he's using for you uh, Aristotle-like Greek thinkers, which, by the way, we inherit a lot of that logic thinking. He's saying there's not anything that exists that didn't come through him. Nothing. 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 So the chair you're sitting on, the concrete that that chair is sitting on, the air that you're breathing, the brain cells in your brain, your fingernails, fingernails. I don't know why I said that. But anyway, everything, everything comes through him. Everything, everything. Through who? The word, through the word, through the word. Okay, including all these spiral galaxies back here, which by the way, each one of these little slits back here, oh, there's a nice spiral galaxy up there. Each one of those has over 100 billion stars in it. That's a lot of stars. And in terms of these spiral galaxies like this, or galaxies at all in the universe, there, there's, some people believe, as many as 100 billion to a million of these galaxies. It, we're in a very large neighborhood. That's what I'm trying to say. So when Chesterton says the circumference became a point, it's a gigantically huge focus in the life of Jesus. So that's what we're talking about. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And what was the raw material? There it is. He said. He said. He said. He didn't say, and God said, collect up all the loose photons in the universe that are unassigned to anything else, and I'll crunch them together like a snowball, and I'll make some stars. He doesn't say that at all. He just said. There you go. Okay, let's move on. Verse 4. It's more than just the creation of the universe. In him, who were the word, we're still talking about the word, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So John's starting to tell us why we should be excited about the coming of the word. Not just because he created the universe, but because this one who came also brings life. 
Again, it's a nice parallel between the Genesis 1 creation account because life does eventually show up right there. There's the material creation of the universe and then there's life that's brought there. And God breathes life into the creatures he's made. So in him was life. And, and now that's, that's a distinction from just breathing. Okay, as we sit in our chairs here, you're breathing, you have life. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about just hearts beating and breathing lungs. He's talking about life. Jesus said in, in John 10, he says, I came that they might have life and they might have it abundantly. We're talking big life. We're talking about what life is intended to be. And if I, uh, spoiler alert again, if you go later on in John, you'll find out that that life really comes from relationship with the creator himself. That's life. Everything else is just existence. So he's not talking about in him was existence. He's saying in him was <gasps> life. Woo! I get excited. So anyway, that's what he's talking about. That's what he, uh, like, did you see Fiddler on the Roof? Did anybody see Fiddler on the Roof? Remember that psalm? To life, to life, l'chaim. That's what he's talking about. It's this vivid, enthusiastic, this is living kind of stuff. That's what he's talking about. So in this one, this word was ah, life. And he was also the light. That is, it implies that we're sitting in darkness, so we don't even know what life is like until that light comes and he shines on us. Oh, this is exciting. The light came and it shined in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. In fact, what I always think in my mind when I think that is a candle in a room and here's a first century candle. Do you know how powerless darkness is to resist the presence of light? Light, <laughs> darkness gone. Darkness can't resist it. And so even though from John's perspective, and John's writing around 90 AD, many decades after the death and resurrection of Jesus, he's saying at the outset, just in case you don't jump the gun when you read the rest of his gospel, sure, Jesus died, but that light wasn't snuffed out because he came to bring light and darkness could not overpower it. That, that's just, that's, that's an incredibly good word. In fact, especially when you're living in a society where we are under the bondage of Roman citizens, is what the Jews were thinking at the time. We're under this bondage, and you know, who sees what's going on? And it seems like the darkness is always winning. When I read the news this week, I feel like the darkness is always winning. <laughs> just think of a dark room and a single candle. Jesus. And the darkness cannot Turn off the light. Darkness has no power in itself at all. But we tend to think that it does, and it doesn't. So that's what he's saying. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. Verse 6, now there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So he's, he's going <laughs> to keep lapsing into one. He'll start to talk about the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, and then he'll go back to the cosmic, and he'll come to John the Baptist. Again. So he's doing one of his, let's talk about John the Baptist. So there was a man sent from John whose name was God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about that light, the light, that all may believe through him. So he came to say there's a light coming, and this light you haven't seen yet, but I will show you who he is, okay? He, and the light was not John. It was this one that he talked about. He was not the light, verse 8, but he came to bear witness about the light, which is an, <laughs> it's kind of an odd thing. Because you know, if you're camping and you're in a dark tent and, and you, know, you can't find your socks in a dark tent and someone says, here, let me help you out. And they turn on a light. Oh, thanks. It, it would be silly for the person who turns on the, the, turn on the light to say, let me turn this on. That's a light. But that's what John did. He's the light. You, you would think he wouldn't need announcing, really. It seems like obvious. If this is the light that's come into the world, why would someone like John the Baptist have to come and say, he's the light? Well, because the darkness did try to snuff him out and to ignore him. And he was saying, this is the light. Look at his light. Hear what he says. You'll find life in him. So that's why. He wasn't the light, John, but he came to bear witness about the light. Verse 9 John goes on, he's writing here, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And now he's giving qualification. It's not just light in terms of enlightenment. It's the true light. That is, it's the vehicle through which truth and facts are made known. So what he's saying in a compact form, he's saying this light has come into the world, which presumes that it came from out of the world. This light came into the world, right? Why? to bring an understanding of the way things really are. Truth. 
the way things really are. And by the way, as a trained scientist, <coughs> the presumption in all science is that reality is only one way. Now, there might be lots of debates about the way things really are, but in the end, all those scientists who are debating all buy into the fact that reality is only one thing. It's only one way. There aren't two realities based on, there's only one reality. And so scientists battle all the time trying to figure out who's got the best handle of what that reality is. But everyone believes there's only one reality. Okay? There's only one. So that's what he's talking about here. The true light, the light that helps us understand the way things really are instead of the way the darkness wants us to understand them. So he comes in and gives us an understanding of the way things really are. Gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So now we know that this word that was with God and was God and was outside of the universe originally has made a guest appearance into creation itself. Tell me if that's not a crazy idea. It's as crazy as, have you ever read Sherlock Holmes novels? or watch them on TV, but, but you know, the author, Sir Arthur, Conan, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he wrote these. Wouldn't it be funny if one day Watson came to Sherlock Holmes and said, an amazing thing happened. I met this guy in the street corner, and the guy in the street corner's name is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock says, what's so big about that? Well, he claims to be the author of this life that we're in the middle of. <laughs> and of course, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle the only way that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle can have his characters meet him is if he writes himself in as a character in terms of what he's writing. Because other than that, it would be inconceivable to think that we're living in some kind of novel where an author is writing the details. So he writes himself into it. Well, that, that's a very weak metaphor of what this is. God puts himself into his own creation. And he comes in to bring the true light. He comes in. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And here we get to the huge irony. In fact, it's the premise of John's entire gospel, is what he's giving us here in these first 18 verses. He came into the world. He brings true light about the way things really are. You would think the creation itself would recognize its creator, but it didn't. It didn't. And on top of that, it gets worse. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. His people, the Jews, who had a special edge on everyone else, the Gentiles. They, they knew stuff from earlier in the Old Testament times. They knew about this God. And, and they knew about the coming of this promised anointed one, this Messiah. They should be all ready to go so that when Jesus shows up in the scene, the Jews would say, I read about this, I read about this, I, I saw this. That's the Messiah. And yet largely they missed him. They missed him. I, it's really astonishing. And by the way, I have to say this every time, before you point your finger at the Jews who seem to be so clueless, <laughs> they're there to remind us that we also are clueless. So it, you can miss the Messiah. It's possible. And many people today miss it. He came to his own and his own people didn't receive him. But some did receive him. Right? That's what the New Testament's about. Some did receive him. And John goes on, verse 12. But to all who did receive him and who believed in his name, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So the true light comes into the world to give an understanding of the way things really are. And the issue is if he was received by people and they believed who he was, he would give them the right to become children of God. So what was necessary on the part of the potential children? What did they have to do? Believe and receive. Receive is the first step, receiving Jesus. And then he says, can I tell you who I am? And then you believe that and you embrace that. By the way, it says believe in his name. See that? Believe in his name. And again, we've talked about this before. Anytime a name, the word name shows up biblically, it's talking about the fact in the ancient idea that you name someone based on their chief characteristics, who they are, their nature. Their nature revealed is their name, right? And we, we still remember this slightly from Native American culture. Uh, and you wait to name the child until the child does exhibits some kind of trait that you can say, ah, oh, well, now I know what to call him. I'm going to call him drooling boy or something like that, you know, or running bear, or something, something that characterizes a chief characteristic. 
Uh, in Genesis, Genesis 2, when Adam is naming the animals, it's doing that so he can say, I've seen the chief characteristic of this animal, and so its suitable name is this. It reflects what it is. So here, believing in the name of the word means to believe in the, in the character and the nature of who this one is. Um, I, I'm going to make another point right here. It's time to have another little ex-Mormon moment. Um, well, I'll, I'll do that in a second. I, I'm jumping ahead. So believed, what if someone on the outside, and I've heard this many times before, well, hey, I believe Jesus was real, so, so I'm in, right? I believe he's real. I'm in. I'm going to heaven. Yay! I believe Jesus is real. Uh, no, because, well, what about this? So if you believe Jesus was real, do you believe that Hitler was real? Yes. So that makes you a Nazi. Well, no. Why? Well, because I don't believe in the stuff he stood for. You don't believe in the things that motivated him and drove him. You don't believe in what he was all about. And that's what belief is. It's really believing in the, in the nature of that person and what they're all about. When Jesus said at the end of Matthew 28, go and make disciples, that's what a disciple was in the Greek understanding. A disciple, say a disciple of Aristotle, was someone who'd wake up in the morning and first thing they'd do is they'd go to the school, Aristotle would be teaching there, and you'd sit there and you'd suck up everything you possibly can because you want to mirror your life after the character and ideals of that person. To believe in Jesus is to be that tight with who he is. Not just saying I believe who he is, but I believe in who he is. And I want him. That's a whole different kind of thing. It implies trust. It implies following. It implies on many, many things. Let's get Hitler off the screen. He's got too much stuff. Th- this, is my <laughs> this is my little Mormon moment. I need to do this really quickly. So um, he gave the right to become children of God, which means that before they received and believed Jesus, they were n- not children of God. Do you see that? It's very important. He gave the right to become children of God. So what were they before they received and believed in who Jesus was? Paul tells us very clearly in Ephesians. Ephesians 2. We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Like the rest of mankind, before receiving and believing in Jesus, you were a child of wrath. You deserve the wrath of God. We're only children of God in the sense that he created us, but that's where it stops. It stops after that. We are rebellious children. Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray, and each one has picked his own way. But the Lord has caused that iniquity of us to fall on him, on Christ. So really, we, we don't have any edge when we come into mortality because we can't say, well, I, you know, I preexisted, and so just the fact that I'm here means that I'm kind of, I've got an edge on those that are No! Everyone, he says, the rest of mankind, everyone is born a child of wrath. Now he'll talk more about this in the rest of his gospel, but he's trying to give you a clue in the beginning that, hey, even though the light has come into the world to give us understanding of the way things are and we can receive and we can believe him, if you don't, if you don't, the end is the wrath of God. And he makes this very clear. He's sitting with... uh, Nicodemus in John 3, remember that? Because we read John 3, 16 this week. He's sitting with Nicodemus. He says, hey, if you're not born again, you can't even see the kingdom. And Nicodemus starts a conversation. Well, okay, so born again? You mean I've got to crawl back into mom? I mean, what? And he describes what that's all about. There is some radical change that has to happen to change you from a child of wrath into a child of God. And in the middle of that is receiving and believing who Jesus is. So see, John's giving you the conclusion of the book before you've ever read it. So he's going to make these claims up front in the first 18 verses. And then if your curiosity is piqued, he'll say, read the rest of the book and you'll see what I'm talking about. And that's, that's what he does. That's what he does. Children of wrath. So that was my, that's my last ex-Mormon moment for the morning so you can relax. Okay, so these who were born not of blood, uh, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. So again, he's, he's prefiguring for us the fact that those who receive and believe in this word, Jesus, and his origins and what he did, have to actually be born in that process. Or again with Nicodemus, born again. There's a second birth that's involved. And that second birth seems to revolve around receiving and believing who Jesus is. He'll expand this greatly as he goes on here. But you've got to be born. And this time your birth has nothing to do with human birth. Not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, 
It's, it's not any of those things. It's not a human birth at all. It's a whole different kind of birth. And you're born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Wait, are, is John saying that if I receive and I believe in who Jesus is and I want him more than anything else, are you saying that that makes me born of God? Yes. Yes. Receiving and believing. And if you're born of God, that makes you a child of God. There, see, isn't this all kind of tidy? This works really nicely. Okay. Um, but these are written, John says later in his gospel, when he's pretty much done in his gospel, these all are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, or that's just Messiah, that's the promised one, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. His, so his theme is consistent all the way through his gospel. He tweaked your curiosity in the first 18 verses. The light came into the world. If you receive and you believe, then suddenly you're a child not born of man, but born of God himself. And it's the believing that's key. And at the very end, as John's ready to close out his gospel, he says, and so I've written all of these things so that you'll believe. Result, you'll have life. You'll have life. Whew. Okay, so he comes back to the cosmic realm. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Which Word? The Word that created the universe. I always stomp the floor when I think that. I mean like this? Yeah, the Word that created the universe decided to come into the universe not just to make a guest appearance, a cameo to his creation, he came to actually live with us. To live with us. Well, God, you don't understand the problems that I'm having. I mean, this happened. I mean, if you walked in my shoes, you would, uh, oh, well, I guess you have, haven't you? Yeah. There's not a single part of the aspects of what we exhibit or we experience in life that he hasn't walked in as well. There's no way we can say, you don't understand because you've never been here. Because he has. And, and his experience is worse than ours. His experience was so bad they decided to kill him. They didn't want him to be there. His light was a little too bright. He came to dwell with us. And I got to tell you, this is one of my favorite words right here, this dwelt word. <laughs> Are you tired of me doing my word things? This is just really kind of fun. This word dwelt right here uh, is the word that they use for these. Tents. <laughs> he tented with us is exactly what it means. And it's the same word that's used of the tabernacle used in ancient Israel because it was a gigantic tent. It was the presence of God in a temporary dwelling. Get that? Presence of God in a temporary dwelling. So what he's saying here in this part of, of John 1.14, the word became flesh so that in this temporary dwelling he could be with us. Ah! I, I get excited. I don't know if you do, but he tented with us. And the tented thing, you know, it, it implies very strongly that this is not the permanent presence of God. This is just the start in the tent. Again, the temple in Israel became more permanent when David bought the materials and Solomon, his son, built it and became a real structure with stones and stuff like that. But up until that time, it was a tent. It was a tent. In fact, David felt a little bit self-conscious about the fact that once they finally settled in Jerusalem, David had this nice house built with limestone, and it was a wonderful hard kind of place, a real house, oh, a manly house, stuff like that. And yet God was still living in a tent outside the tabernacle. So David said, you know, that's not right. You should have a real house too. You have to go read it. It's a great thing. But God comes back to him and says, no, 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 that's okay. I'm not going to have you build a house for me. But I, God speaking, will build a house for you. Speaking about the house of the ruler Messiah who would come from David. It's a, it's a great scene. And Solomon does build it. So he became flesh so that he might tent with us. That he might tent with us. With us. With us. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Same word here. He wants to be with us. So you're telling me in some kind of crazy way that the creator who was also God and was with God now is going to be with us in this word who has become flesh? Yes. God made flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. Doesn't mean God sends his representative. It means literally God with us. No, no, that must just mean like he's sending his prophet who's going to speak for him and it'll feel like God. No, it means God with us. 
And just read it for what it is. It's God with us. Christ is God with us. Not just a prophet, not just an, the eldest son of God's family, not just all the other kind of variations and permutations. You have. We're talking about God with us. Now, that's why I get a little put off when I see the kind of cheesy little cartoons of the baby in the manger. Because we're talking about the infinite God making an appearance in the flesh, deliberately tenting with us. Now, why would he do that? That's the question that the, the beginning readers of the beginning of the book of John ought to come to mind. Why would he do this? Isn't God like the Greek gods? Isn't he someone who just kind of whips around his stuff and he throws out a universe and whips around some other stuff and he throws out human beings and he whips around some other stuff and he throws out some animals and stuff like that? And he says, good, have at it. See you later. Hope things work out well. That's the classic idea of the gods. And then some god theories with the Romans would say, well, you know, so the gods are up there. They're largely, they largely don't care about what's going on with mankind. But, you know, they sort of need mankind to do some things for them. So, so you know, if mankind does some things for them, like sacrifices, then the gods will say, oh, good job. Okay, I'll give you a good crops this year and stuff like that. It's not like that at all. It's not like that at all. God himself comes in tents with us. Why? Why? And that's answered in the rest of this book. Why? So he tends with us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So John's saying this God, this infinite God, came and tented with us, which means he took on the same, the same living apparel that we have, flesh. He, he, he put, took on flesh. That's our tents, by the way. Some of your tents look more ragged than others. And many of us are looking forward to having new tents that won't decay. That's kind of nice. But they're tents. They're temporary dwellings. They're temporary dwellings. He became, took on the flesh of a temporary dwelling, and as a result, we saw the glory of the Father. Glory is just the manifest, broadcast display of who God is. Through Jesus, he's saying, through this word, we've come to understand who God is because he tented with us. It, it always comes to mind. Philip says to Jesus, you know, show us the Father, we'll be good. And Jesus says, have I been with you? I've been with you so long and you haven't figured out yet. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's exactly what he's talking about right here. That's displaying the glory of the Father. Now, I also need to talk about this, the glory as of the only Son. <sighs> this, is my last, this is my last word thing this morning because this is really important. Um, that, that right there is this word called monogenes. And monogenes, mono, you, we know what mono is. It means only or one, right? Genes means, that's actually the generic word to be. So it, it literally just means the only one. None other. It's the only one. So the word gets used, it gets applied in generic terms in Greek literature to, to imply an only child, an only son, because that makes sense. He's the only one, right? In other cases, other unique things, it's called the only of its kind. So you can really call this word uh, translated into several ways. You can call it one of a kind or the one and only. That's really what it means. The idea of son is not even in there. It's just sort of implied because it's used so much with only sons. When you see only begotten son, that's usually what, it's, what this is. This is word monogenes. But what it's saying is that this is the one and only. He's the only one. He's not the first of many to come out of the father's household. He's the only one. The only one. The only one of the father, the monogenes. The only spoken command in the universe. The only expressed will in the universe. Ah. And, you know, we looked at this a while back when we looked at John 1. I think it was uh, J.B. Phillips has a paraphrase of the New Testament, an Englishman, but he started John 1 where we say, you know, in the beginning was the word. He says, in the beginning, God was expressing himself. I don't totally buy it, but I like, I like where that's going because the word is God expressed. Jesus is God expressed so that we might know his glory, know who he is. Jesus is the active expression of the invisible God so that we can know, so that invisibility doesn't get in the way. So here's the only son of the father, Menongenes, the one and only. And now, he, he, again, he flips over into, he wants to start the whole history of Jesus. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. And the reason John keeps going back to John the Baptist, in a second he'll go way into John the Baptist and start the narrative of the life of Jesus, but because John the Baptist was very popular, he gained some great hearing from not only the, the common people of the time, but the religious leaders of the time. Remember, religious leaders came once, and as they came to find, just to satisfy the curiosity, 
he, he really rips at them. <laughs> you know, he re- as they come to him and he's baptizing people near the Jordan River, he says, who warned you about fleeing from the wrath to come? What? <laughs> and uh, he really takes them to task. He takes them to task because they presume that they're, the blood is throwing in their veins because it comes from uh, Jacob, from Israel, and from Abraham. Because of their blood, because of their ethnicity, that they're automatically in with God. And John the Baptist says, no way, man, no way. That's not going to gain you anything. And we see that theme come up over and over in the New Testament. So anyway, he, John the Baptist, who had great reputation, says, I'm not the guy, the one who comes after me. He's the guy. He's the guy. Verse 16, and so John says, from his fullness, not John the Baptist, but the word, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. I got to tell you, just a personal insight. As I was reading through this verse this week, every time I got to that phrase, grace upon grace, I started to cry. Uh, I think I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Sorry. But, but I mean, let's talk about grace. Grace is an unmerited favor. It's what I, what I don't deserve. It's what I can't even earn. It's what I never expect to have. It's a gift that's never to be repaid. So if I put that on this side as well, then what he's saying is that I have received from the fullness of Jesus unmerited favor upon unmerited favor upon unmerited favor upon unmerited favor upon unmerited favor. I have received from him what I could never earn upon what I could never be ever worthy of. Upon, I mean, just go down the list over and over. And it, 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 really, it really broke into my heart because This is John's way of saying we've received from him not only what we didn't deserve, but we received it over and over and over and over. Not only at the beginning of our life following Christ, but every moment after that. And so I I would close my eyes, and I want us to do this in the sanctuary, just close my eyes and I'd look back in my life and I'd look at the things that God has brought in my life that have been great blessings to me that I never deserved, I never expected, I could never pay for. But what tremendous blessings. And not only once, but then as an idiot, when I do something selfishly sinful, and then I, you know, I confess that with him, and he'd do it again, more grace. And I'd do something stupid, and he'd bring more grace. And I'd do something stupid, more grace, upon grace, upon grace, upon grace. It's, Paul's, it's John's way of saying his intention of bringing good into your life will never stop. Will never stop. All right, so let's just take a few seconds here. And if you bow your heads, I want you to do what I did. Just, just look back for a moment on your life with Christ and what he has done in bringing unending good over and over and over in your life. Okay. That's... Uh, that, that line just causes me to worship. I'm sorry. <laughs> it just does. And John says, how is it that we are recipients of such persistent good in our life? How? From the fullness of Christ. From the fullness of Christ. <sighs> John's looking back on a life long lived when he writes this. He's probably 90, most people think. And as he looks back on his life like we just did, He sees the finger of God in his life because at one time he started to follow this Jesus. And from that point on, life has been characterized by grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And not just a little bit from the fullness of Christ. Grace upon grace. Oh, we could, you know, if you want to do something as extra credit homework today... (laughs) Just sit and meditate on that and thank God for what he's done in your life. You know, he's the one that came and found you. You didn't find him. He came and found you. Brought you to himself. Drew him to yourself, to him. And he, and he, and he included you into his family by adopting you because you didn't have the right blood to be part of his family. He adopted you into his family. And from that point on, he said, I'm going to delight you with my goodness. And you can never buy it. You can never pay it back. I just want it to be a gift. Will you just relax and let me do this? Grace upon grace upon grace. Oh, what good news. If you don't believe that's possible, read the rest of the Gospel of John. That's what he's trying to entice you for. Verse 17. 
The law was given through Moses, the law, the beautiful, golden, sweet definition of what righteousness is in a person. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through. Ta-da! We finally named the word Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. The word, the word is the one who came as Jesus. The word was with God. The word was God. The word created the universe. The word was the light that shone into the creation. The word is the one who came and made a deliberate visit in his creation by taking on the tent of flesh just like us. And he came to be with us so that we might receive him and believe in him and be given the right to become children of God. (laughs) There's nothing else to talk about. Let's quit. No, we're going to talk about a few more things. That's just an amazing thing. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And now we finally named the source of this word. We knew that's who it was going to be. I mean, we read the rest of the book. But he's, he's wanting us to not miss the point. He's being deliberate. The word was Jesus Christ. And so 18, no one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. But the only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. Interesting translation. People battle over this translation too, but I I like how they say this. No one has ever seen God. Why? Well, because he's spirit. Uh, Paul, when he writes to Timothy, now now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. So you can't see him. No one has ever seen God in that sense. But the only God, again, monogenes, the one and only God. What? Remember, with God, was God? The one and only, one-of-a-kind God who is at the Father's side, who was God and is with God, Father's side, okay, has made him known. So a huge part of why Jesus came was to give us an understanding of who this Creator Father is, who this God is. Give us an understanding. And the best way was to write himself into the story like Sherlock Holmes, to write himself into the story and come and take on the same flappy, breezy tent of flesh that we have full of its problems and all that kind of stuff and to walk in the same thing we're in the same decayed places we are drafty as it is and walk in our midst so that he might make known who this god is yeah greek god's a spirit god's a spirit Um, is he a person yes which means i mean is he relatable that's what I think when you say person. Yes. So, I'm trying to scratch my wooden head. <laughs> okay, we're all scratching our wooden head because I'm not sure we can completely get our arms around this. Really. But what we... Yeah. Yeah. The body is material and the spirit is more refined material. More refined material. And you can't support that in the Bible. Yeah, and I think, I think for, for those, those who are coming out of a Mormon background, this is, a, this is a tough thing to grapple with, really. And it's okay. It's okay to grapple with it. Because uh, as God's creation, that's us, I'm not sure we're going to fully comprehend it. Compre- comprehend means master it. I don't think we're going to fully comprehend the nature of God in terms of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But... I know that in seeing Christ, we've seen the Father. Because that's biblical. Christ is the one who came without any air at all to give us an understanding of who God is. And, and, we, and that's a fact. We can take that one to the bank. That one's for sure. And as a result of what he did on our behalf, he's made us also children of God that we were not before. So we can, we can you know, that's there. So we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand on those facts. And the rest of it, in terms of theology of, uh, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity. Ah, oh, what a wonderful topic to scratch our, our wooden heads about. No kidding. It's really, it's, a, it's fun to do and say, what does God, does that mean God? What, oh, ooh, ah. But you know what? Things are very clear in Christ. Thanks is a good place to begin and end your knocking on your wooden head. <laughs> it really is. And, and that's why, you know, even when I talked about that grace upon grace phrase, I know, I, I see that written in my life. I see his repetitive, persistent, deliberate driving in of good in my I see that. It's written there. And I can I can look at that and say, you know what, before Christ I didn't have that. But I can see things he's deliberately done. So that's all I need. Really. I mean I see his hand. Well we we 
Christ in you. Yeah. Oh, we, I got to tell you, see, these first 18 verses in John is John's conclusion of his entire book, put at the beginning. In scientific circles, we used to call this the abstract. So if there's a paper I wanted to read, and I didn't want to read the whole thing, I would read the two-paragraph abstract in the front, and it would tell you the results. And i go, hey, I'm done. I'm done. Well, John uses this two-paragraph abstract in the beginning of his gospel to make you so curious. You say, I got to read about this Jesus guy, because John is making at the front such incredible over-the-top statements about this Jesus that I got to know why he thinks this. Well, just keep reading. That's why he's doing this. It's great. Oh, we need to quit. So the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. He dwelt among us. He dwelt among us. And so he started from a viewpoint from outside the stars and he camped with us in the tent of our flesh, looking at the stars from the other side. And he is the radiance and the outshining of God himself. In a sense, in the reality of all of this, he came intended with us so we can sit at the campfires of our existence and he can sit with us and say, see those stars? Let me tell you about the God of those stars because I'm him. Oh, all of creation was on edge waiting for this to happen. Yeah. Is that a big enough picture for you? Let's pray. Father, we don't, oh, well, this is just too much really. But the the message is so wondrous. Oh, the wonder. Heaven in the flesh of a baby. How? Wow. Lord, I thank you for, I thank you for your spirit using John's pen to put down on paper for our benefit the remarkable truth that this word made flesh had a purpose. It wasn't just to have a guest appearance and look at things from the other side, from the inside. It was to give us a full understanding of this loving God. It was to give us an opportunity to become children of God, to be included in his family. It was to give us the wondrous understanding of this huge and invisible God so that our hearts might fall in love with him, might be drawn to him, and so that we all might be brought to a place where we say, everything else seems pointless. I want you and you alone. And Lord, since the day that we gave our hearts to you, uh, it has been grace upon grace upon grace. And I have to agree with John, that's life. That's life from you. Thank you for your great loving kindness to us. Thank you for your persistence from the edges of the universe to come and to tent with us. And because of that, we have life in you. Thank you for this incredible message now. All our hearts as this Christmas season comes along and allow us to understand in even one small, more way about the fact that you left the bigness and became small so that we might know you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.